I think the biggest myth um, in, I wouldn't say my industry, I'll, because I treat myself as an entrepreneur, I think the biggest myth is that you need a ton of funding to make great things. And that's not necessarily true. You need skills and knowledge. <laughs> um, money will fall if you're able to produce something of value. And unfortunately, I think a lot of people lose motivation because they chase money and they should be chasing how to improve their skills and knowledge and money will come. So you should focus on this, not on um, financial gains. Hey everyone, this is Devin Miller and uh, here with another journey of the, or another episode, if I don't get too tongue-tied, of the Inventive Expert. I'm your host, Devin Miller, the serial entrepreneur that's grown several startups in the seven and eight figure businesses, as well as the founder and CEO of Miller IP Law, where he helps startups and small businesses with their patents and trademarks. If you ever need help with yours, just go to strategymeeting.com, grab some time with us to chat, and we're always here to help. Now, today we've got another great uh, guest on the uh, podcast, Boris Kostrov. Crossed of, and I I know I slaughtered it, but that's as close as I'm going to get. Um, but uh, Boris, we're going to be talking about a, a few different things, including uh, remote management of developers, and also how you go about even recruiting uh, remote developers. Um, looking a little bit at the pros and the cons of a remote a remote workforce, and also uh, looking a bit more into um, how you go about uh, you know researching and uh, preparing a, a, a new startup and and to figure out if it makes sense and kind of what that process should look like. So should be a, a great conversation. Conversation and with that much as an introduction, welcome on the podcast, Boris. Thank you, Devin. Uh, pleasure to be here. Absolutely excited to have you. So now before we dive into some of the topics at hand, just as a quick, quick reminder to the audience, Boris was on the sister, our, our sister podcast, The Inventive Journey. So if you want to go hear Boris's uh, full journey there, certainly go and uh, feel free to check that out. Um, but for those that haven't had a chance to check out that episode yet, uh, just take a minute or two and uh, introduce yourself to the audience. Yeah, great. Um, so my name is Boris and I co-founded the company Remote More in 2019 in, in Berlin, Germany. Actually, the whole journey starts in 2018 and we are a marketplace with over 32,000 developers and above and uh, 1,500 registered companies. We hmm. connect companies and developers and we also do payroll and 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 um and uh taking on like full uh recruitment like recruiting a whole team for software development projects awesome no sounds like a great uh, background and a uh, fun uh, fun opportunities that uh, you get to work with a lot of different uh, developers and and do right. and on that field so so now with that as an introduction, I think that, you know, it's interesting and I think it's probably timely, you know, the ongoing question of remote workforce and remote recruiting and managing and seems like, you know, with COVID, it was popular for a while. Now some companies are kind of pushing back and saying, hey, we want you into the office and others are kind of staying more along those lines and everybody's kind of figuring out what that uh, right balance is um, for them. So maybe you know, before we dive into a little bit of how you recruit and also manage them, just kind of walk us through what are some of the, the pros and the cons of uh, using a remote workforce, particularly with developers? Yeah, I think the topic of um, return to the office is, is picking up steam these days. Um, but I think for early stage companies, it could be one of the reasons they would succeed. So working remotely in a startup uh, allows you to recruit people on a large scale and, and offers um, quite interesting uh, value to cost um, uh, advantages. And um, in that in mind, I think many early stage companies will be founded and will keep on being founded as remote um, because our company was would not have succeeded if we weren't remote. Uh, not only because of the service we offer, but uh, and I also wanted to talk about in the podcast is that building software products in your remote team is one of the ways to succeed um, as a company. When you don't have a lot of resources and you're just starting out, your first time entrepreneur and you want to release your software, being remote could be the 
difference between life or death. Um, mm. So my prognosis is that for early stage companies, this will be the goal to set up um, as we go forward. No, it makes sense. And I'd agree. I mean, it is a trade off. You know, I, I still I'm probably a bit old school in the sense that I think that when you're in the office, you can bounce ideas off each other. You can or sometimes get Absolutely. the creativity flowing and, and collaborate. But on the other hand, just to your point, you know, you get into especially if you're early stage startups and small businesses, every time you do that, it adds overhead because now you're having yeah. to potentially have them full time. You have to yeah. or provide them with office space <laughs> or all of the benefits. And sometimes you don't even have that full time need yet. And so um, right. a lot of times providing that flexibility, especially as you're getting earlier on and getting started, certainly has that added benefit, not to mention you can sometimes find it as less expensive and also uh, widen your category or your pool of uh, candidates to work on it. And now, one, I think, oh, sorry to interrupt, I think um, meeting in the office is very important uh, as well. And this could be done in remote setup. So it's remote more, we meet um, about four times a year for about a week uh, in person. And this helps us to align and, and get spend time together. Hmm. So the fact that you're remote, and again, we're talking about early stage companies, probably up to 50 employees. Which for a lot of founders, getting a company to 50 employees is a huge milestone. So um, um, meeting in person is too important. There are some advantages, and I'm not here to argue otherwise. Hmm. Uh, but you can still be a fully remote company and leverage on the significant advantages of being a remote company. No, absolutely. I think that, and then you have to take a look and, and make sure it uh, lines up with what you're what you're looking or to do and accomplish and uh, meet those needs. Now, let's say you say, okay, I take a look. I think, you know, we are early stage. We have limited bandwidth. We have limited budgets. We need uh, different candidates or different uh, talent mm -hmm. pools or, you know, all of the above. And so it looks like it'd be, you know, a decent uh, opportunity to expand out or to leverage some of the remote workers and uh, take that as an opportunity. Now, how do you go about recruiting them? Because I think that's the next question because, you know, right. sometimes it's hard to find people, you know, I think it's easier now, but they want to work remotely, getting them set up, making sure they actually do it, that they are a good fit to work remotely, that they can manage themselves well and keep on task yeah. and all those. And so I think that, you know, that added or sometimes adds a bit of complexity or complexity when you're looking for who to recruit and how to recruit. So how do you kind right. of any thoughts initially on, on how you go about doing that? So I think um, one of the key parts of working remote is uh, that you need to find a person. So I'm a big fan of personality tests. And I think apart, let's say you're creating a developer. Um, you know, you need to find a person with solid skills, somebody who's able to deliver on building the software, which is probably common sense. But I personally like to hire people um, who have the right personality to be remote. What this means is that you need people who are self-motivated, people who are independent, people who are um, able to communicate really well. So unlike um, when you work at the office and when you have these scheduled conversations in remote work, the setup is a bit more proactive. So this requires those people to be great communicators, people who are able to uh, to reach out and ask questions who are curious to, to work. So that's why um, I promote more uh, when we screen people, we would always look at these variables. So I'll use third-party personality tests and I'll deselect um, people with, um, I'll try to find people who have exactly this set of personality traits. Uh, mm -hmm. And this helps me a lot to have uh, people who are good fit, not only for actually doing the work, but being good remote members. Mm -hmm. um, so now just to, maybe to follow up, so you, you mentioned one is doing kind of, you know, having them take a personality test to right. see if they check some of those boxes or meet those criteria, any other kind of tools or red flags of people when you're, whether it's interviewing mm -hmm. them, talking to them, right. you know, looking at work history or resume right. or whatever, kind of anything that is further insightful in addition or another tool or is a red flag and saying, hey, they're not a good fit. Well, um, so if, for example, you're doing an interview and the internet connection is bad, um, that's a huge red flag. Um, mm. So you want good internet connection. Camera, uh, the camera is very bad or like microphone, you don't understand. Uh, 
it, it gets interrupted or some other way, this is like a huge red flag. Um, communication skills. So if I'm interviewing someone and just don't click with the person in terms of communication flow, it's that's that's an issue for me because I'll have to work with this person or work to work on day to day basis, and I don't want to feel uh, anxious or stressed out by talking to him. I want to have good flow and feel good working with these people remotely. Some people actually in the office they could be just as fine, but when you work with them. They, they might not click, they might not turn their, own, their camera on or, um, yeah. Um, another thing uh, that I like is people who um, utilize the mindset of being part of a group um, because it's easy for some people to show up and act as independent con contractors. Mm. Um, they'll just do, do their tasks and not think about the company as a whole. Um, this, this is also another Red right, flag, like even though to the spot during the interview process, this could come a few months down the road, but generally want people who are here for the team and, and able to be proactive and communicate well and have the right setup, uh, very important. I sometimes notice some people who would do an interview, casual interview from a car because they're on the go. This is also a red flag for me. I mm -hmm. want the person to have the setup. So I know that he's productive. Hmm. No, I think that makes sense. And that's uh, some good red flags. And I agree if yeah. they're going to be working remotely and yet they don't have the right setup, they, you know, if they don't have a place that they can actually sit down and do the work, they don't have the internet connection, they don't have cameras, they don't have all of that, then it's not setting them up for success. And they're unlike, you know, or they're camera shy and they just don't want to even bother to turn on the camera. All of those right. things are going to make it a much more difficult situation and probably or wouldn't be a good, good alignment. Now, let's say, so you go through that, you find the perfect, uh, you know, perfect candidate, you recruit mm -hmm. them, they are a good fit. Now, how do you go about, you know, managing? I mean, you talked a little bit about you guys have a right. few on-site uh, meetings every once in a while, but also how do you just manage them day in and day out? Because at least I know sometimes for me, you know, kind of out of sight is out, is out of mind. And, you know, when I see them and I interact or I have a reason to, you'd reach out and you talk with them. But if you don't walk by their office, if you don't see them, sometimes it takes a bit more mm -hmm. of an intentionality to, to help to manage them to success. So kind of thoughts on how you re, uh, manage remote, remote uh, workers and developers. So... I think regularity is a big thing here, uh, meaning you create the flow and momentum for people to to get up to speed. So I'll have daily stand-ups and not, not every day, but uh, up to three times a week with the team. Um, I like to have these regular check-ins so we could, uh, if they're stuck in some problem, we, we get it uh, addressed immediately. Um, I'm in a remote setup, um, the importance of having clear objective uh, well-defined goals is like super important um, everything needs to be well documented uh, you don't need to buy a expensive software for OKRs uh, mm -hmm. you could have a nice template in Google Sheets um, that's available for free online uh, but you need to have clear goals you need to have it in writing and they need to be specific. They need to be communicated to the team. The team needs to have a, agree to these goals and be on track with you, um, to be on the same car and a bus, and and to make sure that, um, you know, you you all aware of what's going on. Um, and I like to use tools um, that will measure performance, um, be it for software development, as um software project software like jira or even trail which is for free uh could do the job and sales it's i think a good CRM system the, the important part is that it's it's possible to be objective and clearly measurable now sometimes that's not possible and there is the need for qualitative um uh, element but um if you if you have many quantitative uh, elements than one or two qualitative elements and not, not, not a big deal. Hmm. Um, so I also like to have people in, in Slack or Teams. We personally use Slack. Um, and I insist that we have at least six hours of overlap in our daily routine 
Um, I unfortunately think that two hours, three hours is not enough. I do appreciate that sync communication, but as a person, I really, I just the more productive when I talk. Um, so I prefer to jump and whenever I have to say something, instead of typing it down, I prefer to talk it out. Um, but that's my approach. I know some people prefer written communication for a day-to-day -day basis. I don't. I think it has value um, to think through to what you're trying to say, but uh, I personally prefer to talk. Uh, that's for me the, the way to go about it. Uh, but for important things, let's say um, work objectives or work tasks or different responsibilities, uh, OKRs, I'll insist on having everything in writing just to make sure we're on the same page and we can reference to this later on. Um, so these would be some of the important things. We also have, uh, I'm thinking about it, we also have all hands meeting every two weeks where we gather the company. A particularly interesting exercise that I like to do is that I like to ask every company. I remember we're a small company of just about 20 people, but I asked them to share three highlights and three lowlights um, in their last two weeks. Just so everybody can hear what's going on in the company. Um, this, I believe, creates a good good spirit and you're able to understand what's going on in different corners of the company if you're not able to see the person physically. Mm -hmm. um, so these are some of the key components um, that I really like. Uh, for me, communication. Like, if we don't have good communication, not good. Um, so that's a key in... in I guess in every work setup, but especially in remote work. Hmm. No, I think that that's a lot of uh, great, uh, great piece of advice and a great takeaway. Now, one or one additional kind of follow on question is one that I just always find interesting or curious people's different takes on it, because I think one of the worries or concerns from, you know, bosses or management and people paying the bill, so to speak, is that, hey, if, if I'm working with somebody remote, they're on an hourly basis. I don't know if they're actually, you know, overcharging me work or not doing the work and they're just uh, or running up their hours. And, you know, if it's one thing is if, it, you know, how, you know, what to expect or how many hours, you know, approximately mm -hmm. this should take, you can get a, or gauge, you know, if they're making progress. But if it's a newer project or something that's, you know, a bit more unknown, then it can create a sense of nervousness. And, you know, one of the things that I've seen, some people love it, some people don't, is that they have, or as an example, software that monitors if they're at their computer or if they're right. working and or how active they are. So thoughts on, you know, do you love that type of idea? Do you mm -hmm. hate that type of idea? Or kind of, how do you address that concern of, hey, I don't know, you know, I can't see that they're actually even coming into the office. How do I know that they're putting in the hours that they, they say they are? Right, I think, um that's a valid concern uh and it's reasonable that you question yourself about how can i make sure that they deliver into work um that's why i like to have clear okrs clear goals uh i'll have activity based goals so let's say you work in sales um there will be clear activity goals that you need to hit mm. uh, but in this way i make sure that really putting in the work um also in software development this could go the same way i would expect a certain amount of output to be delivered i always lead with trust so i try to give as much trust as possible um and if i see that this trust is uh, not holding i'll start asking questions about output and if the questions persist Unfortunately, we'll have to part ways, but um, I'll try to give as much as room for uh, people to prove themselves and to perform against the set expectations. Mm -hmm. I would never use a tracking software on the screen. I think that's, uh, if I have to use it, I better part ways. Um, for me, this means the trust is broken and I'm not the type of person that I want to feel like I need to be your security guard and look over your shoulder. That's not the culture I like to create. Um, this, I believe, is not sustainable. Mm -hmm. I always aim for sustainable things. And I want people who are proactive, who want to work with me, uh, who want to join our mission, 
and people who are interested to deliver and grow as, as, as professionals. So I believe this is much better approach, um, but it's mission driven. Hmm. No, um, I think that, and it, I think that, yeah. you know, setting those clear objectives, metrics, and what, what they're going to be accountable for helps to alleviate a lot of that. And then we're just saying, Hey, you have to do, you know, this is the expectation. If you don't meet it, then, you know, regard a little bit, regardless of how many hours you're working or, or in claiming you're working. And I'm not saying that they aren't, we're still not meeting the objectives and it still may not be a, a good fit. And so I think that that's a, or sets it up for a much better path. So, well, now I we're do already, think, oh, sorry to interrupt. I do think, um, in today's business world, um, there are just so many bad managers, um, people who don't really have the skills. They've been promoted. When I say bad skills, doesn't mean necessarily that they do it on purpose, but maybe they're just learning how to be good manager or people who are not particularly that passionate about their work, but they're there just because they need to pay the bills or... Um, they're trying to do the good things, but they're just not succeeding. <clears throat> and this is um, easily visible in, in remote work. Because in remote work, you need output to make sure that things are going right. Well, in the office, you could involve some type of politics. You could involve some type of uh, chit-chatting to cover up for your bad performance. Um, in remote work, that's not possible. It's pretty much black and white for the most part. And a lot of people, when they have bad skills in management, they'll blame the setup. Uh, they, unfortunately, many people don't like to take responsibility for their lack of skills or lack of knowledge um, for some reason. I personally wouldn't. I always take the approach where I would prefer to take on full responsibility and if I don't have the skills, uh, go out, learn the skills and come back. But many people don't, and that's sad in today's business world. Um, and unfortunately, uh, they'll blame the setup instead of growing as people. So I mean, that's key uh, if you want to have a company that has a growth mindset. Um, and that's regardless if you are in an office or not. Um, yeah. No, I think that's uh, definitely some uh, great piece of us pieces of advice and uh, some uh, great takeaway. So awesome. Well, uh, hey, we're already reaching towards the end of the podcast. It feels like the conversation just barely got started. So we'll uh, certainly have to have you back on sometime or either to this podcast or to uh, one of our sister podcasts. Um, but as we're wrapping up the uh, episode for today, I always like to uh, wrap up with uh, one question. So we'll jump to that now, which is within your industry, what is the biggest myth and why is it wrong? Uh, that's a very good question. Um, I think the biggest myth um, in, I wouldn't say my industry, I'll, because I treat myself as an entrepreneur, I think the biggest myth is that you need a ton of funding to make great things. And that's not necessarily true. You need skills and knowledge. <laughs> um, money will fall if you're able to produce something of value. And unfortunately, I think a lot of people lose motivation because they chase money and they should be chasing how to improve their skills and knowledge and money will come. So if you focus on this, not on um, financial gains. Hmm. No, I think that uh, definitely makes sense. And it's a, a great, uh, great myth to dispel. And the, when you focus purely on money, you're not going to find the the no. excitement and the gratification and certainly not going to set you up for the long run. But if you can find Absolutely. something that you enjoy and are passionate about, doesn't mean that you won't work long hours and still won't get worn out, but at least you'll uh, be loving and enjoying what you're doing. So that's a that's great, right. uh, great uh, myth to dispel. So Awesome. Well, with that, if uh, people want to reach out to you, they want to be a customer, they want to be a client, they want to be an employee, they want to be an investor, they want to be your next best friend, any or all of the above, what's the best way to reach out to you, contact you, uh, find out more? On, on my email, uh, bk at remotemore.com. So if you're sure, it's remotemore.com. And on my phone number, 312-900-5580. And also feel free to find me on LinkedIn, Boris, um, Krastev, K R A S. D E V um for my family name. So yeah, uh, I think that'll be uh, a good way to get connected. 
Awesome. Well, I definitely encourage people to reach out to you, make a new connection, support a great business. If nothing else, uh, make a new best friend. So thank with that, again. thank you again for coming on the podcast. It's been a fun. It's been a pleasure. Now for all of you, the listeners that are out there, uh, if you uh, can help us to reach even more startups and small businesses to help them along their journey to success, just uh, make sure to click share, subscribe, and leave us a review. Um, and along that note, if along your journey or someone else's, you ever need to have any questions about patents, trademarks, or anything else, feel free to go to strategymeeting.com, grab some time with us to chat. We're always here to help. Thank you again, Boris, for Thank coming you. on the podcast and wish the next leg of your journey even better than the last. Thank you.